fun including um, sort of like where is the root of resilience in agriculture? Um, I think they have some interesting um, and poignant ideas about that that they're gonna talk about. Um, uh, maybe I'm gonna pause there. Carrie, are there any uh, opening words that you wanna say before we uh, turn the camera over to Javon and Matthew? Yeah, just briefly, I don't wanna take up their time. Um, Carrie Baltham with the American Grassfed Association. And uh, Matthew and Javon and my paths crossed in 2012, 2010, somewhere in there. So it's been quite some time. Um, they're the kind of people that you know are always there and um, sometimes hard to find but uh, they're always on the farm and I'm, I'm thrilled to have them with us because they have a really interesting uh, uh, take on resilience and you'll learn their history. And Matthew and I both have a very strong opinion about the phrase feeding the world. And so I'm gonna let them talk and then let you talk to them because I think that you'll enjoy what they have to say. So. Matthew and, and Javon, thank you. And uh, their bios are interesting. Google them sometime. <laughs> I think we'll also put their bios in the, the, yeah. the chat box. And um, just a quick word before we get started, we are live on Facebook on the Kibira Coalition AGA and HMI pages. So uh, if you want other folks to listen in, you can either give them the Zoom link or you can send them to the Facebook page and take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so very much for, for welcoming us into this space. Um, my name is Javon Sage, um, and I am, oh, folks would call me a Renaissance woman. Um, uh, my grounding is, is in the land and is in healing. Um, I actively work as, a, as an herbalist, as a wellness coach, birth worker. Um, in addition to consultant, um, I've been working in the food and farming industry um, since probably about, two, I want to say like for the last decade, since around like 2009, um, you know, working and living in New York City, like becoming an urban chicken keeping apprentice and really diving into that space of like, where does your food come from? Um, that curiosity around how does the food get to the farm to your plate um, and how do you make it taste good has been um, a central focus um, of my work um, in addition to how can we um, break down the barriers um, to access to good food, um, to healthy food, to fresh food um, for, for all different kinds of, of communities. And so um, I'm always excited to continue to dive into this work and to extend that work to conversations around seeds, around equity and inclusion. And um, my name is Matthew Rayford. Uh, I am a sixth generation farmer. Um, I, my first career, um, outside of being in the military for 10 years is I'm a chef. Um, and, uh, so I call myself a chef farmer, a chef and farmer with one F. Um, so I have been back home on this family land, um, since 2010, 2011. Um, however, I was raised, um, on this family land also, and this land's been our family since 1874. Um, like I said, I'm the sixth generation and my children are the seventh who have planted, harvested and eaten from a crop off of this land. Um, and I'm very, very excited about um, being here today and being able to talk about um, resilience and what um, resilience can look like um, in the terms of resilience um, that can show up each and every day and how uh, as a collective, um, we can start talking more about resilience and how we can uh, stay connected um, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So I think for, for both, I mean, um, for who maybe had a chance to like kind of see the breadth and depth of our work, um, you know, in addition to this, this land right here, um, for, I want to say from 2015 um, to, to what, the end of, um, 2018. yeah, to 2018, we actually um, opened and ran a very successful um, restaurant um, in our downtown um, area. So um, we're, our farm is definitely in the country. We're not urban um, farmers, but our restaurant was in, you know, our, 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 we're a small town, but still within the city. And so, um, 
for us, it was this idea of like, how can we, you know, take our work um, for both of us as chefs, um, for both of us as, as land workers and, and educators and kind of bring that space alive. And so, so much of our um, was centered around this idea of educational adventures and taste. And so, you know, giving people that connection to, you know, here's, you know, here's this pea, like, you know, think about like the Sea Island Red Pea and, you know, here's, you know, where, where it's grown and here are those connections, here are the stories, you know, it allows us to tap into um, the Gullah Geechee um, culture that, you know, is up and down this coast. It allows us to have conversations around, around taste, around flavor, and how that makes it to your plate. Um, and so for us, we ended up, you know, closing it because it was just the right time, um, especially for us to to move on to to other projects, um, but I, I know like one of our um, the amazing parts of that was that we were able to like bring in so many people from all over the country to like our small town, our small small coastal town, um, to to really experience these international flavors and these conversations around how food makes it to your plate um, and what how was our American like food system how it was built who built it um, and, and how we got to where we're at right now. Yeah, and, and to piggyback right into that, um, I, I love history. Um, there's really some amazing things that have happened in history and there's some really horrible things that have happened in history on a global scale. Um, and so we can all agree to all of those things, but what I do like about history is, especially when it comes to food, is how it is consistently playing out on all of our plates every day. And we oftentimes don't take note of it. Um, so I'm going to use rice as uh, one of the things. I'm sure just about everybody on here eats rice. Um, I'm not going to talk with meat, Carrie. I'm just I'm starting off you know, in the starch area first. Um, so let's talk about rice. So everyone here that's on here that eats rice, if you were to look at the history of the rice culture that is here in the United States, it started off um, with slaves. And the reason that those slaves were brought over was for the knowledge that they had about growing rice. And I, and I just wanna like jump on top of that. It's like, we're, we're talking about enslaved Africans. Enslaved. So, so yes. I wanna make sure that so like having this very, conversation. Um, these did not start as slaves. Um, they mostly were, were talking um, West, West African um, rice growers. We're, we're talking about folks who were talking about healers, midwives, um, cooks. We're, we're talking about farmers. We're talking about educators. Um, and they were, you know, caught, brought over, and forced to work this land. Um, and we're and when I say this land, um, we are in what was traditionally country. Georgia so, coast, um, and you know, and the Carolinas. Um, these 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 landscapes were were carved by enslaved Africans. They were brought over for their 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 farming skills. They were brought over for their technology and how they did their own rice growing. And so. I think that's one of the things that we always want to make sure that we center within it. Um, it wasn't by accident. Uh, it was it was very specific. It was very um, you know systematic the way in which it was done. Yes, and and so the the reason that I'm bringing them up, our pups are barking, so we have to give them a treat. Um, but one of the reasons that I brought up rice is because everybody can connect to it one. Um, if you start understanding where and how our agricultural system has been built um, here in the United States, it allows us a chance to A, ground ourselves as individuals and ground ourselves as a collective to be able to have broader discussions. And so part of that resilience is also seeds that were brought over, okay? So we've got planters, we got seeds, and now, if we play it forward to where we are today, we have to think about what, no matter what city you're in, everybody wants to have the best Southern restaurant around. 
And that food that's on that plate is often enslaved people's food. It is also poor people's food. And they always say that it's poor people's food that the rich want to pay for. Because I never grew up eating shrimp and grits. I did, that wasn't a thing. I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, and now people are selling it for $32 a plate. And for me, I'm like, well, the shrimp are right out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that that's something that that I, I want us to like also pay attention to when we're talking about resilience. And I know everyone's trying to figure out, well, okay, we're talking about seeds, we're talking <laughs> about this. Where does that come into resilience? The resilience comes into saving the seeds. The resilience comes into taking the knowledge that we have now and also giving just due to the people that actually brought that knowledge and or those amazing things. Mm -hmm. The other reason I bring because where we are in coastal Georgia, we're part of the original 13 colonies. Um, and in this specific port that we're in right here was a defensive port, one of the first five ports that George Washington put into place um, because the Spanish were right down in Florida. So when we start talking about this landscape that we're walking in and walking on, um, we have to be able to also have those conversations. Mm -hmm. We also have a huge conversation about the Portuguese and why we have such a large fishing culture that we have here um, also in Brunswick, Brunswick Georgia. Mm -hmm. We talk about a lot of the one pot cookery that the Irish brought over. And so what I'm getting at is that there's a large, we put a gap in there for how and what we are doing. And we're consistently trying to reinvent the wheel instead of just taking a moment, okay, to realize that resilience is based on us understanding what actually used to be. Mm -hmm. And I also think on top of that too, um, you know, for folks, if we can kind of like put you in place of where we're at. So, so we are on the Georgia coast. Um, we are 30 miles from Florida and 15 minutes from the beach. Um, and so we're, we're talking about great oak trees, Spanish moss. Um, we're, we're talking about marshlands. We're talking about, um, we're talking about tourism. Um, we're talking very much so about around food deserts or food apartheid. Um, and we're also talking about inequality and we're talking about um, uh, the resiliency of people and the resiliency of communities within that. So um, for folks um, who don't know where, you know, where Brunswick, Georgia is, you know, we're, we're about 45 minutes below Savannah, which a lot of folks have heard about Savannah. And we're also our farm. So 10 minutes away from where Ahmad Arbery was, was murdered in February. Um, so we're talking about the Deep South. Um, we're talking about you know, for our communities as everyone was going into shelter in place, including us, um, was also like dealing with how those inequalities um, and you know, having to draw on our own personal resilience and community resilience in order to like get through. Um, and so I just want to make sure to kind of understand like what that looks like. Um, us in the, the four years that we had our restaurant, we were also, you know, doing our farm. And within that time, we actually faced um, two major hurricanes in less than a year. Um, we're talking about what it looks like, you know, and, and um, kind of joke, kind of not joke that, you know, with, with everyone having to go into shelter in place um, in March, um, everybody got a, a chance to like experience cane season feels uh, and, and um, to see what cane season feels like, you know, making sure you have enough, you know, toilet paper in case the stores are closed, making sure that you have enough food, enough beans, enough water, enough, you know, of your medications, because you're not sure how that storm is going to come through, how long you're going to be electricity, is a tree going to fall on your house, are your windows going to fly out, um, and you still have to be able to survive, to eat, to like take your medication, to enjoy a hot cup of coffee, you know, all of those different things. And so, it's, and then all kind of on top of it, for that first 
hurricane, um, which was a hurricane, um, was it Hurricane Matthew, I think was the first one. Um, we, I actually lost my entire chicken operation during the hurricane. Um, so, you know, all of these, like, you know, a hundred chicks that I had, um, um, that I had to, that I raised from chicks, from two day old chicks um, to getting to a place to where that, you know, that, that first like four to six months until they lay, um, I lost them in a day. Um, and to deal with that as, as a farmer, not, you know, not even adding on top of it, you know, with mandatory situation, like having to close our restaurant. Um, and I think it also happened on a payroll week. Um, so, and for us, we did not evacuate. We actually stayed here on the farm and for us, um, having to like go through that, go through that, you know. Um, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri. I'm originally from the Midwest. So, you know, I know what a, what a tornado kind of looks and feels like um, and, you know, how the air changes. But, but imagine like, you know, sitting through that wind um, of, you know, the windows rattling. You're not sure if everything, you know, what's going to be standing um, when you wake up in the morning. Um, and, and that kind of that uncertainty, that, that fear that, you know, are my animals, did I secure my animals well enough? Um, is, did we harvest enough before the storm came down? And also just, you know, it, for anybody who's never been through a hurricane, like there's just, there's nothing but wind. And so at some point your brain, you know, the power's out, it's dark, there's nothing but wind, you can't see anything. And you literally have to figure out, okay, like how am I going to like mentally make it through the night and be ready to like deal with what comes after. Um, and so we've had to tap into that resiliency, you know, yes, on the farm, yes, in our food business, and yes, in our, in our personal lives, um, in very real ways. Um, and then Hurricane uh, Irma came less than a year later. Um, so it's like wash, rinse, repeat um, in, in that way of like, you know, um, do you, do you start over again? Do you, you know, pick back up that, that chicken operation, which we ended up not picking up the the chicken operation for at least another like three three years. Three years, three years. yeah. It took yeah. three years to get back because it was a lot. It was it meant the infrastructure was gone, and then just you know the um and, and, the and, trauma of right, having the to trauma like of having to bury that, your yeah. animals and or or can't find them. Or, like I don't know if Javon told you, it was one hundred and twenty five chickens, yeah. ducks, and guinea hens. Yeah, that's a lot of animals. And, and just and I raised all of them. Right. And then it just all disappeared, right? And so it's also like, how do you how do you then not only get your head back in the game, but also imagine this. When Hurricane Irma came, we had just started getting the soil back right for us to get back into the thing again, right? We're about ready to plant fall crops again. Mm -hmm. And boom, it was like, oh God. Well, this time we lost the plastic, the, the, the four mil plastic off of our high tunnel. And when I say we lost it, I mean like it's nowhere. Like we drove to other people's farms, figuring that it like blew up in the air and probably fell down somewhere within almost a 20 mile radius. We even put out a thing like, hey, anybody seen this? <laughs> and it, it's, it's gone. I don't know where it went. It just disappeared. And so now what do I do? Okay, so now I've lost, the year before I lost like all these animals. This year now I've lost a high tunnel, which I, we were already talking about the crops that we were going to plant that fall in there so that we could have high house tomatoes and some other things. And it was gone. So now when you talk about resilience, it's like, well, do I stay in this game? Do I keep playing this game? Because right now it feels like I'm losing, I'm losing, I'm losing. And then you're also like looking at each other like, okay, we can't, you know, it's hard to be a rock. Like when one person's going through something, it's easy to be a rock for the other person. Or it should, you should be a rock for the other person. It's, it's easier. It's easier. Not easy. Not easy, <laughs> right, easier. But now we're both in this thing of like, okay, well, that's happened. And then the very next year, the restaurant so it was a lot of like how do you bounce back from those kinds mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. and so when when i look at it i look at one of the things that javon brought up to me about being resilient 
And one of the things that we consistently say to each other and that she's been able to like say is, have you centered yourself for the day? <laughs> not for the week, not for the month. Have you centered yourself for the day? Because we don't know what's going to happen every day. This 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 uh, th this global pandemic has shown us that we have no freaking clue what's going to happen from day to day. Like I right. just came across someone yesterday that you know they have been socially distancing at work. Not everybody goes into work at the same time, and now one person is asymptomatic, and boom, everybody in a whole office is now running grabbing their tests and sheltering and put well not quarantine now right so like th they didn't wake up that morning thinking about that but imagine if you just center yourself for a moment every day to know that guess what anything could possibly happen something's gonna happen not every day is gonna be roses and all those kinds of things to just get yourself in a place right. to move a little bit. Well, and I think that this is, um, you know, because you know, I do, I do work in the seed world and the the food and farming advocacy world as well. And I think as we're having conversations around sustainability, regenerative ag, like all of these different things, I think that the the ultimately the thing that comes it, it comes down to is that farmers also need to center themselves farmers, ranchers, gardeners, seed keepers, <laughs> land stewards, like you need to center yourselves like in your plan. Like, are you finding ways to be regenerative in your own life? Are you finding ways to mm -hmm. ground yourself? Are you yep. finding ways to, you know, yes, acknowledge, you know, the trauma of, you know, losing, you know, parts of your farm or crop failing or any of these things, and then find ways to like, you know, work forward and heal from that um, is the same way in which we, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, when you test your soil and you're trying to figure out, okay, what are the amendments that I need to add? What are the things that I need to do to like make this like give life? Um, you have to think about that for yourself as well. Um, and that too often we get caught in that cycle. Um, and, I, and I feel like, you know, for, for the folks who are farmers on here, like your life looks very much so like the restaurant tours as well to where you're like pouring so much into this work. Um, the margins are thin, um, patience is thin and, you know, you don't clock out, you know, you're, you're doing this work. Um, continuously and and every day there's still work to do there's never kind of like a boop boop there's a period and i'm done <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> but but it's a lot and so if you don't like center yourself your health your wellness um your your joy um into that work um are you really being a successful farmer um, and, and I think that that's one of the things that I see time and time again, that like farmers, um, are taking themselves to the brink, um, and beyond. And guess what? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that with your horse. You wouldn't do that with your chickens. You wouldn't do that with your soil. So why would you do that with yourself? Especially knowing that if, if you look at some old pictures, I, I, um, I have a picture of my great grandmother sitting on the porch, um, just sitting there, just sitting, not doing nothing. She's just sitting there. Wasn't even expecting probably me to even take that picture. <laughs> but I, I want everybody to kind of think of a farmer sitting in a rocking chair whittling. You know, that's their, re that's their relaxation. That's their unwind. And for us to really be resilient, we really have to tune into taking our care of ourselves, taking care of ourselves first, right? Because I literally believe that food security is national security. And if we aren't taking care of ourselves, there's no way the food is going to be able to do what it needs to do. You know, everybody talks about energy and planting by the moon and being biodynamic. All those things are real things. Like that's not some, you know, fakey stuff that's just floating out there. Like we literally do plant the potatoes by, you know, a certain time in March. Beware the Ides of March is what we always also say because we here 
possibly could have a freeze after it just been 75 degrees. So we have to pay attention to all of these different things. And we also have to write it down. So here's something that I'm gonna talk about, about being resilient. The only reason that Javon and I are able to farm this land like we're able to farm is because my great grandmother and grandmother wrote to each other about what was being planted and what was being harvested, okay? Not typed it into a computer and had these great crop plan logs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simple notes, really small things that's handwritten. Because if ever this magical system of Zoom falls out of the sky, what do we have? We have nothing. And so we have to be able to have some things that are written down. Those letters allow me to know literally from like 1938, I think is like the oldest one I have, of when to plant peanuts, when to plant peas, mm -hmm. um, when rabbit season is coming for, for hunting, when deer season is coming, like all those things. And to date, it hasn't failed me. It just hasn't. And that's also about being resilient is uh, writing things down. And also the soil, the legacy is in the soil and you have to dive in and pay attention to everything that you're doing with the soil so that as it's coming back, as it's regenerating, as, as all of that fungi and mycorrhizal, as all that stuff is alive in there, that we're keeping it alive. You know, that's generations and generations and generations and generations, thousands of years is that soil. And the old saying is God ain't making no more land. <laughs> he ain't making no more land. So we don't take care of what we have right now. There's not gonna be anything. And, you know, Carrie alluded to the, 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 our conversation about feeding the world. And um, I, that's not my mission. My mission is to feed everybody that lives in my area that I can connect to, okay? I, I know that small farmers are going to be the key and whatever you consider to be small. I, I don't know if that's a, 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 a sales number for you or if it's how many animals you have or whatever, but whatever you think of as a small farmer, local, right? And whatever you consider local to be, 50 miles, 25 miles, 100 miles, 500 miles, whatever you consider it to be, know that that's how the feeding is going to happen. That's where the resiliency is going to be. And I think um, for me, on top of that, I, I, I want to make sure that we're like framing this as well as like not in um, in kind of like that lone ranger, like oh. small farmer um framework like that is not that is not what we're saying no. like um because i i don't you know just from doing it as that's not possible it's not sustainable in no. any shape form or fashion um but i think there's some really beautiful models for collective work right there's beautiful models for finding ways to like work in community whether that's buying clubs um food hubs um but i think it's i think it's gonna take like community really coming together to to you know not not everybody wants to or can farm but how how can we all play different ra uh, roles within the food system to support one another and start working towards um towards a vision because i think it's important especially as we're we're grappling um with the you know for us increased hurricane seasons i think this year is like in the last like what 30 to 50 years was the most active hurricane season yeah um, i think they ran out of the alphabet yeah yeah, yeah they, they, had to, they, had the to they had to now. fall back um, <laughs> and so so i think it's like understanding understanding that you're not going to be able to do it alone nor should you be doing it alone mm -hmm. um that there's you need to be able to create um a network and and yes i love these these global like sessions um, that where we can have conversations with people all over the world. But do you know the farmer that's like up the road from you? Do you know the farmers that are in the county over? Like, do you have a network of people to where, you know, if you lose your chicken operation, who can get you chicks um, in a short amount of time? You know, um, do you have people who can help you, you know? 
yeah, do tractor work or to like help you plan out um, or all of those things. Like it's so that that idea of like the lone, you know, farmer who is like in there and is like, you know, feeding the world, like that's false, that that never existed. Um, and it never, especially never existed here in the United States where our agriculture was built on the backs of enslaved Africans. Um, so for us to like start to have like very real conversations around the work and the support system and the vision and the opportunities um, to start thinking differently about the way in which we're working the land, um, to think differently about how we feed people like in our region, like to start thinking more so around like regional food systems and taking into account um, culture equity, inclusion, Definitely. all of these different things Definitely. and really creating a system that is that is responsive to like what's happening in the world. Um, I know for us here on the coast, um, you know, when a uh, shelter in place or you know, quarantine, whatever you want to call it, you know, was, was coming down um, for us and it, it came down in mid-March, um, right before our St. Patrick's Day. Um, people were reaching out to us. They were just like, they were afraid like that food was running out, that they weren't gonna be able to eat, that what are we gonna do? And for us, we also have, el we have elders. We have folks who, who have like, um, you know, uh, underlying conditions. And so we were like, well, we don't want all these people on our farm. <laughs> you know, like, don't just come out to our farm right now. Well, one, don't come out to a farm even on a good day. We're, we're working. Right. Um, <laughs> but but also like just understanding that we, we needed to make sure that we could protect our elders and our community. And so our community, um, one of our organizations, um, Way Green, which usually does an in-person farmer's market once a month at the beginning of the month, um, we were all able to come together and we pivoted. Um, and we did online ordering and then we created, you know, a distribution model that allowed for socially distancing and we had a drop pick off location, pick up location, socially distance um, at the top of our farm, you know, at the top of the road. And we also had, you know, one in the county over. And so we were able to like work together as a community. Mm -hmm. um, like I was making hand sanitizer for everybody, you know, somebody else donated masks and gloves. And so we were able to really come together to like feed our community when people were afraid that they weren't going to have enough food to eat. Um, and that's not something that I could have did with somebody in California. Right. Um, maybe we could have had a beautiful conversation about it. But like when we're talking about supply the supply lines that were disrupted distribution that was disrupted the empty shelves like you know when are lysol wipes going to come back in stock again like right. you know just being really honest toilet paper it's gone <laughs> for was, months was like how do we create a, a system that allows like our farmers to be able to respond um in a in a quick manner and that only really works, that kind of coordination only really works when you're in community. Um, and so again, that lone farmer isn't the answer, like community like based work that supports farmers is is key to, to moving forward. Yeah, and and you know, I, I, I definitely have to comment on the, the way green model in itself. Mm -hmm. Like literally, um, Connie Oliver was able to say, she called all the farmers that were in the farmer's market. I, I want to build a picture out for you so that you understand yeah. how this, you know, how it, how it happened. And, and, and I think this is the crux of what we want to talk about, which was mm -hmm. like, how do you build community and build resilience? Boom. Yeah. So basically Connie reached out to everybody and said, Hey, I don't have a clue of what's happening with food right now. Like we went to our grocery store and there's nothing there. And the running joke became, well, I guess we're gonna have to figure out how to feed our community, like literally in those terms, because what Javon's saying about people just showing up on our farm going, y'all got eggs, there's no eggs at the grocery store. I was like, what? No eggs at the grocery store? That's crazy, that's bonkers, right? Someone who's hoarding eggs, is that a thing? Um, and so it was paramount that we connected um, 30. That, that we connected with all of the farmers that we knew of and had a really good conversation about how can we all do this knowing that we can't have a farmer's market anymore. That literally went into 
them creating an online market where people could order like it was a grocery store, like a cart, yeah. and then they could pick it up. Now, originally, it was only in Waycross, which is about 30, 45 minutes from our mm -hmm. farm. Originally, it was only in Waycross. In less than three weeks, it was in Waycross. Then we had one at our farm in Brunswick, Georgia. And then they had one in Blackshear, which is another 30 minutes away. Then they had another one that they pushed all the way to Jessup. They literally created a food distribution system that was based upon an online thing in about a 50 mile radius of all these farmers. And what I, what, what I will say to that, and actually two hours because folks came as far away as Tipton. Yeah. Um, what I will say to that is that that was about all of these farmers being in community with each other. So they didn't just go to the farmer's market, put up their little booth and bounce. Like this, we're talking farmers that were more like family. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. every shade creed color race whatever you want to throw out there we were all that mm -hmm. and that turned into this month we just had our first uh farmer's market at tractor supply and we found out that this is this was one of the highest grossing farmers markets that they had and what they equated to was all of the work that they had put in since the global pandemic mm -hmm. came to where everyone talked to everyone to the point that no one brought the same thing to market, mm -hmm. which is important, right? If I got carrots and you got carrots, we got to figure out how to sell all the carrots. Absolutely. And so that's like really the importance of like, you know, one of, you know, centering the farmer and the farmer's ability to like be able to, to do what they do, which is like, you know, let us grow food or collect eggs or, you know, what, whatever that looks like. And then be able to create a market that can, you know, respect the farmer's time and create space to where people are, are making money or being able to, to sell their products and being able to like find some, some of their own like breaks and resiliency instead of trying to figure out by themselves, like, how do I get I like all it. of these eggs to out into the world like when i could just work in community and we can come up with some solutions that are gonna like work for for all of us um and i want to make sure that we give folks a chance to um uh, ask questions as well um so i know we're, we're having kind of a side conversation but i would love if you want to make this point and then we can move on to q a actually it wasn't a point for me to make actually the oh. point for you to make oh okay uh -oh. okay what, what so was it? just to be clear um would you speak to the people that were not farmers that were engaged in like what all of their other pieces are that help all of this because for a moment there you, you started talking about the people that are you know like there are oh, some yeah. people that want to farm that's yeah. they don't want to do anything else they just want to farm so you know what i mean what's, so, what's really interesting is like i mean even just thinking about um the the chicks that i got you know uh earlier this year and you know the the winter before mm -hmm. you know like that was from a community member who i was like involved with slow food in and you know she had come to one of the markets and she's like hey you know if you're ever interested in chicks like i don't want to i don't want to like grow chicks like commercially um but i'll grow chicks for you um and so yeah so we created that kind of relationship we have folks who um volunteer at the market um who don't grow they're just like we want to support you know farmers and we want to make sure food gets our community so they show up and they're they're way green t-shirts you know ready Masked to, to up and mess everything. up and, and ready to help out um we have other folks who are who do like you know consulting for around farm food safety and stuff and and they're just like hey like i'm just gonna come and like i can give y'all some some technical pointers to make sure that you know everything is is good and you're ready to go. And so so it's like, it, it takes like, literally when we say it takes a village mm -hmm. um, to support a farmer, like that that's the truth. Like it, it takes a village of people, you know, somebody who's interested in, in web design, somebody who is interested in like social media marketing, somebody who just makes sure that pictures get taken on the day of the farmer's market so that the farmers have photos that they can use in, in their own social media. And so it's like finding different ways in which we can, not all of us wanna be farmers and that's okay. So how, what are the things that we, what kind of support do we need as farmers in order to be successful? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
So um, we definitely want to give at least 15 minutes or more for anybody that has any questions um, on anything that we said or questions that you want to just. We're here. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> we're here. So make sure you ask questions. Otherwise, you're just going to be sitting here. Okay, so how do we both take care of ourselves? Um, what's our self care like? Um, so, <laughs> some, you know, sometimes we're good, sometimes we're bad. Um, no, no, it's 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 all it's all cyclical. So for me personally, um, I am as as an as an herbalist um, and a food alchemist. Um, so much of my work, my personal work, centers around herbs. Um, I'm also a a breath work um, facilitator um, and studying for my yoga teacher's uh, certification. And so for me, um, it's about being able to like find space, um, to like find that personal space, um, to like really listen to like what your body needs. And so for me, um, that looks like quiet time, that looks like doing like breathing exercises, that looks like meditation. Um, and then I don't, I don't have any sitting around me, but, you know, I make my own, um, you know, in addition to selling commercially, I also make my own um, herbal remedies and stuff. And so, um, so I live like in that space of flower essences and, and tinctures. Yeah. Well, I, I, I follow her lead. So she, <laughs> <laughs> whatever she says, I'm, is what I'm trying to do. Um, we do have another question and it is, how do you measure the regeneration on your farm, like soil health, for example? Do you think it's important for farmers to take this step to get land health certification? So here's, here's what I'm going to say. When I said it starts with the soil, even your animals, it starts with the soil. And part of it is, it's not about, you know, I, I hear people talking about, you know, leaving land fallow and uh, taking stuff off. I, I, I really believe that if we give back to nature what nature gives us, like by composting um, and using whatever methods you like to compost, static, red wigglers, African night crawlers, black soldier flies, whatever it might happen to be, we give back to nature what nature gives us, we will be able to regenerate the soil on a constant basis. So to give you an idea, we're on what's called a silty, sandy loam. Um, and so we always get people like, oh, your soil sure is acidic. Well, guess what? There are things that I don't grow here because of the way the soil is. And I'm okay with that. Um, and I think that that's a big thing. Like I run into farmers all the time that like, yeah, I really want to grow, but my soil ain't. And I'm like, because uh, everybody wants it. Uh, okay, well, grow the things that you can grow. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't grow those things, know that also the soil will never be able to regenerate itself mm -hmm. because you're not giving nature what it needs. Mm -hmm. And what's needed here may not be needed in Oregon. What's needed in Oregon might not be needed in New Mexico. What's happening in New Mexico might not be needed in New York. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's understanding yeah. like where you are. And it's, and it's, I think part of it is like working with the land and not against and not the against land. It. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that that's something that's, um, that's really important. Like we have um, this amazing um, seed keeper, um, Sarah Ross, who, who works at uh, UGA. And so in addition to working at UGA and working on their historic farm, which is one of the first farms like in this area, um, she also has a seed company that's all about creating um, seeds um, that families can use to grow grow their own food and making sure that it's like relevant to this area. So, you know, not all the seeds grown wherever are going to be able to grow well in your soil. So how can we create, in addition to a regional, you know, food system, a regional seed system, um, because, you know, I'm the seed nerd. So the reds, <laughs> a regional seed uh, system that will allow us to like um, keep and exchange like seeds that are, that work with our climate, that work with our soil in very good ways. And so instead of like trying to force 
you know, this is Matthew's favorite example, force a Chioga beet uh, (laughs) and said, maybe we're growing tillage radishes, you know, like maybe there's some other ways in which we can like work with that um, and do that in a way that's going to be responsive to the land instead of trying to force the land to be something that that it's not. Um, And on the the other part of the question, I just want to touch on this for um, certifications like that. I think that, um, you know, (laughs) it's funny because there are things that I love to get certifications in and there's other things where I'm like, you know, kind of take it or leave it. Um, You're going to have to figure out for your farm, for your market, for your budget and what's possible as far as like your market and being able to make money on which certifications you want to go for. Um, I think that that's just um, a reality um, with, especially with, you know, folks like Walmart getting into the organics um, business um, is that, you're not going to be able to charge the same that you you would have depending on your community and we are in a very on a um yes there's a lot of like money because there's a lot of tourism but like that stratification is like there's a lot of poverty if it wasn't for that tourism we would be considered like a very very poor poor. um area and so people aren't willing to pay the price that we would charge if we were um to be certified this, certified that, certified this. Um, And so we still use those practices or better because we're also using indigenous farming practices. Um, But we we're not going to, you know, basically pay for certifications that we're not going to be able to like at least break even on. So it's, it's also, you have to think about the business side of it. Do the certifications actually help your business make money? Um, or are you always like in the red because you're trying to keep up with the certifications and you don't have the market to actually pay for that? Yeah. So just, I'm going to piggyback on that one other thing. And then I want to bond to make sure that she takes this, yeah. this very next question. So the land has been in my family since 1874. No chemicals have ever been used ever. So how do I figure out that, and I'm using my particular Mm -hmm. case, that's why Javon said, hey, everybody has to figure out their own. How do I figure out what certifications I should get when the USDA didn't even friggin' exist when this farming was being done on this here land? And this land has been in my family, not land that I bought from somebody else like five years ago. So technically we're grandfathered in. So technically we should be grandfathered in. Absolutely. <laughs> Give me a half hour on that. <laughs> yes, we should be grandfathered in. But there, but people are still going, oh, why aren't you certified in that? Why aren't you? So it's also figuring out where things fall in. So our original thought was any certifications that we get fall under marketing. If we can't pay for it out of our marketing budget, then we don't get certified in. Because guess what? If I'm using indigenous practices and the land's been around and we've been farming it for so long. Well, and part of it too, for folks who don't understand um, how how this worked is that um, uh, Black folks, African-Americans were actually cut out of the, of the, um, the fertilizer game in so many ways like you know all the chemicals and everything else like it was it was very and see it was yeah seeds too so it was very specific so even if we wanted to use chemicals on this land we did not have the access to do so so that and that's why when we say like why should we pay for organic certification when we there has never been chemicals on this land because we did not have access to those chemicals so um and continue to use you know those those indigenous afro-indigenous like farming practices so so i just want like so folks can kind of understand Understand, like how that happens and how there's so there are so many um air properties that don't have chemicals and have never been conventional like um agriculture in that way um, because we we were actually shut out from having access to that. So, um, which, you know, it was awful, um, but at the same time, yay, our land is organic without even having to try. Uh, right. <laughs> so so we, we, it, was, it was a blessing in, in some ways. Um, but I think also like part of that, and I wanna talk on this because I know we're starting to kind of get in is um, 
the the question also was around um i want to just yeah yeah i'll let you all so i'll hit this one is um for folks who are building community um on those who are new to remote and rural areas and are queer bipoc etc so just so you know i can check all of those boxes <laughs> My background is actually in LGBT organizing um, before, long before I got into like the food and farming world. Um, and so for me, I, and, and also just so you know, I lived in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, before moving down to Brunswick, Georgia. So just- That's why I'm letting her, because she can explain that. It, it's, and also, you know, it's kind of the, if anybody's ever gone to, 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 to Maine and like, you know, understand that difference from, you know, being a Mainer or being from away, um, you kind of understand, like I am from away. Um, and so in so many ways here. Um, and so part of it was like, you know, one, as far as like building communities, I think it's one is like finding out the different people that you can connect with. So really kind of like survey your community. And yes, you should definitely reach out to your immediate neighbors, especially if they have like things like, you know, cows, hogs, like all of those kinds of things and just getting to know them first. Um, you're gonna figure out like um, if you are, you know, queer, trans, you're gonna figure out how safe you feel coming out. Um, but I, I always like when I'm in those instances is like getting to know people first. Um, and just, you know, kind of like getting to, one of the things here in the deep south that we understand is that, you know, if you do go up onto somebody's property, you know, and you go to their door, you knock on the door, you step off the front porch and wait for somebody to answer. Um, and so being, you know, respectful to, to your elders and, you know, there's lots of like, yes, sirs, like no ma'ams, like all of those kinds of things. That's very much so a South thing. Um, and so getting to really know your community, um, getting involved with different organizations, um, cause you never know who you're going to come across. Um, I think it's always important, especially in those is to also see if there are educational institutions in the area. Cause normally they'll have, um, like more resources that they'll have access to in different communities. Um, and especially cause we are, we do have a huge, like um, the, the, in this area, cause there is tourism and a lot of people from like Atlanta and other places have second homes here. Um, there's also like, there's a season also of like more um, open openness within this community as well. And so for me, it was all about like making connections and talking to people and then you know, going out from there. Um, it can be intimidating, especially as a, a woman with locks um, to come down to, to the deep south in this way and to also be in a rural area. Um, but I find that I've been able to just, I'm able to be open um, and to have conversations and to build that trust. Um, and also to find out if other people are, were, you know, are trustworthy as well. Um, and yeah. so you'll, you'll start to find community um in that way it's but it's it can be slow i mean it can it's not a it's not a fast it's not a fast process, it's not a fast process at yeah. all to build trust um in in rural um communities but that, i think that's where those organizations come up way green like different farmers organizations like food mm -hmm. organizations and being able to join um here also there's a huge um com uh, faith communities um so if you are a person of faith um that's a really great way to like get engaged and get involved and kind of figure out, you know, is there like a, a youth faith, you know, more of a, there's usually churches that are more geared towards like youth and in that area. And sometimes those are more open than those that maybe have been, you know, that the church that's been there for the last 150 years, but you know, it's, it's open and it's loose. So you just have to find ways to have conversations around that. And I think that goes into also, um, there's another comment on there. Like, I love hearing about your experience with networks of sharing and co-op organizing, what are major obstacles to build out um, or rebuilding more infrastructure from sharing farming equipment. And when you have human connection with your customers, they know what you have. This is absolutely true. One of the things that we have to make sure of is that we are always, always, always talking to people, saying that closed mouths do not get fed. And I believe that in my heart of hearts that if you don't step up and have conversations with people and talk to people and open your mouth, you won't know what's going on. You won't, you'll always presume that blah, blah, blah doesn't like me. Have you ever said anything to them? Have you ever said hello? Like it, it's amazing what happens 
when you say hello to somebody. It's amazing what happens when you show up to events and want to know who the people are and not just like, oh, I need to get, I need to sell all my carrots this week and nothing against anybody that sells carrots either. Okay, that's like my second time using carrot as an example. Um, but uh, I, I, I just want everyone to be cognizant of this is how you build a co-op, how you build a community is all about you. You have to also be willing to put in the work. Mm -hmm. You have to put in the work. You have to open your mouth. You have to have conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have to be okay with not being right. Be okay with being wrong about things. <laughs> be okay with knowing that you don't know what your ass just don't know. Be okay with it. And guess what will happen? The whole world will start opening up to you. I guarantee you, if you took today and say, you know what? I need to start thinking like, I don't know what I don't know. I guarantee you, you're going to start learning a whole bunch of stuff. People are going to open up to you because guess what? They're like, oh, not a know-it-all, not an egomaniac, not a, you know, let's, let's, let's cut some of those things out so that we can build the trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is actually going to be the final key yeah. um, for all of that. Yeah. And I just want to touch on, I'm going to kind of pull in some of these questions like together as well as like, um, for us, like working in community is, is something that's important. I think that um, for for us, I mean, that's part of part of the reason why we wanted to do the restaurant too, because our restaurant wasn't just a restaurant; it was a, a multi-use culinary space. And so we taught cooking classes, and we did special dinners in addition to you know doing Sunday brunch and all of those kind of fun things. And so, so for us, like being in community. Um, and understanding the challenges of being in a rural community that the restaurant like gave us a space um, to be able to like extend that and create a much larger community than we would, you know, sitting on our on our farm with just our heads down. And so so for us, like that educational um, and eating piece was 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 key. Um, to us being able to tap into community in that way, um, working with organizations like Weight Green or with our Slow Food Coastal Georgia or La Danza Escoffier, like for us, um, working in community and with community groups has been key. And I think for all of those, I've probably been a president or something at some point, so, <laughs> except for Weight Green. Uh, now yeah, that you now, mentioned now that it. I mentioned it, um, I, I seem to be, a, a, you know, I, I just, because I am so used to like being in like a, you know, a bigger city. Um, Cause I was actually, you know, originally I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. So I was actually raised in the farmer's market um, in Kansas city. And so for me like that, um, having that community center that's centered around food and farming, like it's something that's, been that was me. Yeah. yeah that, that's eight year old me. Like, you know, seeing when the corn season starting and, and watermelon and the fresh spices and the cannolis. And, and so for me, like that, that was so central to like my upbringing. And was parade like, for your cows. Yeah. And parades for our cows, you know, for, you know, Carrie, like that's where, that's how we're going to bring in the cows. Um, so for folks who don't know, Kansas city is like, a, is a cow town. Like it's a big city, but it's a cow town. And so um, American Royal, 4-H, like that's that's how I was raised, um, even though I was in a city. Um, and so um, for me, that's always been key is like, how do you create these like community spaces um, that allow us to, to connect in very yeah. real ways around food and around the seasons. And so that's how I understood I just took for granted that every city had this like huge farmer's market, you know, year round farmer's market. And, and there's all these different yeah. things and all these different people and independent coffee houses. And like, I took that for granted um, that that was just how it was. You learned how to raise pigs and chickens and that, that was, that was the world. Um, and and then it, you went to New York. And then I went to New York and I was like, no, that's actually not what you know what what everybody has and then travel you know i've done a lot of organizing around the country and so you know seeing that that's not what everybody has is really is really fascinating um and, and sad you know like i i think we've tried for a long time here to like also find ways to build more of that that kind of third space here um and so our restaurant became that space um our farm, you know, before COVID <laughs> was becoming that space as well. Um, so like being a way to like also step up into what you feel may be voids in your community. Um, I, I think that, you know, and this is touching on another question that was in there is like, 
listening to your community is important and also kind of balancing that with like what you like to do um as as a as a full-time entrepreneur <laughs> like Cereal. if Cereal you if you if you don't like what you're doing if you don't like what you're growing if you don't eat what you grow Ooh, say it if you don't eat what you grow then huge if, thing how are you gonna be resilient if you're not eating what you're growing you can't you can't do it and you're not gonna be able to sell it um, I used to run a gourmet market and an espresso bar in, in Brooklyn. And so we worked with small producers, small jam makers, you know, Amish farmers, like all of that to bring in their stuff. And I can tell you because I enjoyed the stuff because I love to taste it because, it, you know, because I grew up in the farmer's market. I'm just like, if I can get somebody to taste something, I can sell it. If I've tasted it and I, and I can explain what that experience is, I can sell it you know, I can sell a $10 jar of jam now. Like, you know, like I, I had to, I had to learn that. And, and the way that you do that is by, you have to have pride in that. You have to have joy in it. You have to have experience in it um, to, to be able to do that, you know, unless you're just doing wholesale and you're just dropping off, you know, pallets and pallets of potatoes, like, which, you know, is, is a little bit different. But when you're talking about being a small farmer that's like in community, doing farmer's markets, on farm sales, online sales, like you need to be able to have a conversation with people around taste, flavor, your growing practices, like all of those things. So and, yeah, I think and, that that's more important than a certification. Yeah, for every, sure. Any day. Any day. And, and, and it's just amazing because um, Javon and I have been to many a farmer's market across the United States. And it's a pastime. It's a pastime for us. And oftentimes we go in and we we ask the exact same questions of every farmer. Hey, and we, and we learned this from Dr. Lenny Sorensen. You should always ask the farmer, "What does that taste like, and how do you cook it, and do you eat it?" Right. Because if they can't tell you how to cook it, that means they can't tell anybody else how to cook it. So people walking up, they're looking at it. Well, that's why you got a pile of it. You got a pile of radishes there because you can't tell anybody about what it tastes like. And part of that resiliency too, you know, and I just, um, because Dr. Lenny Sorensen is just a beautiful homesteader, culinary historian, and, and one of my mentors. And mm -hmm. what she taught me about resiliency is that any farmer that's worth their salt is making sure that their family, their farm workers are fed first. Mm-hmm. Like you're not going to take your first harvest straight to market. Straight to market. You need to make sure that you're fed, that your family is fed. Right. Because ultimately, if you're not feeding yourself, mm -hmm. how are you going to feed your community? How are you going to feed your region? How are, are you, you going to feed the world? Right. Um, if you can't do that. Right. Yeah. You you have to you you have to do that because you know why? I think you 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 and I had a conversation about farmers living in poverty, like. Yeah. I, I'm in my head. I don't understand how a farmer could live in poverty if you're growing food. Let's just start there. Like, what, what do you mean you're on welfare to 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 buy food? You you grow food. So so none of that none of that should be happening. Now, are there other things that you have to pay for and expenses that you have? Absolutely, I get that. But when it comes to eating and eating well, you know who should be the most healthy people in the world. Farmers. Farmers should be the most healthy people in the world, especially everybody that's on here right now. We're all talking about regenerative agriculture and sustainability and organics and all that kind of good stuff. We should be, we should be the healthiest. And this is me at 53. So I'm I'm that whole thing outside it's in my beard, but I mean age and wisdom, I guess. But I mean, I really want everybody to understand that like farmers should be eating their own food. They there, there should not be a farming family that does not know how to do some sort of preserve out of at least one of the crops that they're growing. I'm not saying you got to know everything. I'm just saying that there should be at least one thing that you're able to say, oh, yeah, we grow tomatoes. <laughs> Are there any of those tomatoes put up for next year or for the middle of the year when you want whatever it might happen to be? Um I really, I really believe that that is going to also be the key to resilience going into 2050. That farmers are going to have to realize that we have to take care of ourselves by eating the food that we grow. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that and that goes from growing an animal to to growing a chioga beet. You have to. We have to take care <laughs> of ourselves. Chioga beets get such a bad rap. No, that was for me. I <laughs> let me tell you something about chioga beets before before I get off. The first time I tried to grow chioga beets, they wouldn't grow. The second time they wouldn't grow, and I was like, "What am I doing wrong?" And somebody was like, "Man, you just need to throw some French radishes in the ground, and they'll grow." I threw them jumps in there. They grew. I threw the bull's blood in there. That grew. Could never get a chioga beet to grow. And I was like, I don't get it. And then I realized, you know what? My soil don't want chioga beets. It's not me. It's the soil. The soil don't want it. So it's not going to happen. So I just gave up on chioga beets. And that's how it also became part of my conversation whenever I talked to people. It's like, don't be trying to grow just because somebody said, oh, it would be great if you grew chioga beets. Right. And then, you know how much money I spent on seed trying to grow just that one beet? Yeah. It was asinine. But, but yeah, well, <laughs> oh, great, awesome. Oh. <laughs> it looks like we do have some more time. So folks do have more questions. I think one of the things that I think we may have missed, um, but it's like kind of that conversation around, you know, um, climate change or any wisdom that was passed down. And oh, I think yeah. the biggest thing is prepare. I think, you know, um, Matthew's Nana passed at 96. And so we're actually in the house that she yeah. built and lived in. And so, what we um what we found you know cleaning up the house and getting everything you know ready was that there was all these like random jugs of water everywhere like we're talking like somebody had a big thing of hawaiian punch and drank it all cleaned it out filled it with water tucked it under somewhere um and so like that kind of like preparation piece i think is the key um, and then the, also, I think one of the things, and, and my, my granny did this, and I know other grandmas and grannies do this, is like when there's a thunderstorm, like literally like turning everything out off and like just sitting yeah. in, the, in the dark, in the quiet. Um, that's, that's something that I think is like Taking in nature. so important so very, um, very is to important. be able to like find spaces to be grounded Still. yeah and so right, right now i know we're like in the space of like doom scrolling um in in so many ways and for you know like where you're just like okay the feed the feed the feed what's happening yeah. now oh my goodness this is happening now what's you know and we're like kind of stuck in this like not just 24-hour news cycle but like our devices are literally vying for like our attention um and i you know uh, fall to that too so just so you know yeah. like i'm not sitting over here like in ohm like you know all day every day i don't have the time for that but <laughs> but like you know it it you have to figure out like um where where is it best to put your attention you know yeah. how how can you um you know yes you know center yourself at the beginning of the day but also know that you can always recenter at any time right even if it's just like a minute at mm -hmm. the top of every hour, you know, where you just kind of like take like a really yeah. deep breath and a and a few sips of water or a cup of water if you're not drinking enough water. Right. Um and, and and really <laughs> like recenter your life, recenter your body, um, because it's it's so important to that long-term resiliency. Um, it's so important to to make sure one, like any any kind of like um I feel any farming system, whether it's organic, sustainable, regenerative, whatever, 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 is it's important that if humans like don't center themselves and that same care that they take for the land, like we're, we're going to continue to lose farmers. We're going to lose them to burnout. We're going to lose them to, you know, like their, 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 their main job that actually pays their bills, <laughs> you know, like, and, and people are going to be stretched. And I think that this year, um, this you know COVID year has been a year of of clarifying a year of people being stretched to the brink of of finding different ways to heal of finding different ways to to take those deep breaths like you know have you like when do you find yourself like you know like one of the things that I always tell people is like you know just kind of like yeah, you know true, like yeah. come up like mm -hmm. you know like raise your chest like allow your oh. Your lungs. She's talking about my posture. The, the full, the full up. breath um, that they're that they're built for. Like our bodies are built to take care of ourselves. Right. Like everything is like optimal for 
for our, our care, our nourishment. And so we just have, we just have to remind ourselves that the same way you would, you know, work on your, the pH of your soil, like you need to do the same for your, your mind and your body and your spirit. Has anyone ever like scratched themselves like, like a scratch and then, you know, a, a month later you realize that there wasn't a scratch there because your skin has what regenerated itself. So if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not going to be able to continue to be able to regenerate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, Javon is much more calm um, than me. I'm more stay ready so you don't have to get ready kind of a guy. Um, I have a go bag pack. We, we've uh, since I we've also been together. Have a go bag. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm, always, I pack it. I'm, I'm a prepper light. Yeah, I'm not a full. Yeah. I'm not yeah, full she's on, a prepper light. I'm, I'm prepper. I'm, I'm I'm a prepper heavy. Like I I know I can still carry a fifty or seventy five pound rucksack like I was in the military. So that's about how much my rucksack weighs. Like I I know that I do not want to ever be caught for lack of better words with my pants down. Like I really want to make sure that I am ready to go. And, and, and let me, let me, let me couch this for you. That's not necessarily ready to leave the farm, right? That's like making sure you have water catchment systems in place, right? So that you're collecting water as it's raining to make sure that the livestock can con continue to drink, even if you have a power outage, okay? Because that power outage usually comes with some sort of storm, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that some water has fallen from the sky. So catch it, right? Um, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. What crops are you growing that your animals can also eat? Are you growing anything that your animals can eat? Um, I, you know, Carrie's like, yeah, we're, we're grass farmers. You know, we, we grow really good grass, you know? <laughs> um, and so I think that, that, that we really have to think about it that way. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And that means, you know, also goes back to taking care of the soil creating the things that you know on your farm is needed mm -hmm. okay so that anything happens if a tree falls on your farm and you know you got a lot of trees calling somebody and asking them to borrow their chainsaw kind of don't make any sense now does it so it's those kinds especially of things if like, the roads are out especially if the roads are out right yeah. so what things what things do matthew and javon need to be okay with if anything ever happens. So it's really interesting. We already had toilet paper at the house. We didn't have to worry about yeah. going and stocking up on toilet paper. Why? Because we have things in our go bags and we have things just here in general, right? Because anything can happen. Now, well, I'm not and you saying, can always use a washcloth or a bidet. You can always use a washcloth or, or a bidet, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many farmers have bidets, but you anyway. You should totally have a bidet. Totally have I'm a, just saying. Bidet's a thing. It's your, yeah. your toilet paper usage. We'll go down. Talk oh about being God. regenerative. Like yeah, talk there's... about being resilient. But that's a lot of water. No, it's actually we can we can go into we it. can go into it. Later. But just just so you know, there's there's ways in which you can do that. And I think for me, you know, when I lived in New York, I, they considered me prepper heavy. But here, I'm I'm prepper light. Yeah. <laughs> but but part of that too is like also making sure, like for me as as an herbalist and as a as a healer. Like, yes, I have like my, my alcohol and, you know, like all of those other like regular things you would have in your first aid kit, but I also have an herbal um, mm -hmm. component to that first aid kit. So I've got my calendula and comfrey salve. I've got a stress um, glycerite. I've got, you know, stuff for high blood pressure. I've got, you know, like I always make sure um, that in addition to like that, you know, kind of like nuts and bolts of a first aid. But there's also herbal things. There's tea for calm. There's, you know, um, poultices that are that are ready to go for for wounds. And so so for me, like that's like part of it. And then for mm -hmm. folks who are maybe more on the more, you know, kind of energetic level, I also have flower essences that I work with as well. And so so there's always there's so many different levels in which we can you know, really start to um, to work on ourselves. And when I say like mind, body and spirit, I mean that. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean religion. I just mean like, how are you taking care of yourself? Um, how are you tapping into like the, the resiliency that is already within you? Um, yeah. And I think that that's something that's key. You know, I, when I'm working with 
um, cause I am a birth worker. So when I'm working with, um, clients as, as a doula, um, you know, I have this, the same conversation, like, you know, this, this resiliency, this empowerment already exists within you. Mm-hmm. How can we tap into that? How can we remind ourselves of that? And I think that that's something that, um, you know, as, as, as farmers, um, as earth workers, as seed keepers is something that we always need to keep in mind is that we, we have it within us. Um, to to survive, we have it within us to thrive, um, and you know the goal should always be to thrive. You know, right. like I always say that yes, we can totally survive. Mm-hmm. Yes, we and we should and we will. We've we've got rounds, we've got toilet paper, we've got you know giant twenty pound bag of beans. You know, like we're we're gonna be good. Right. Um, but ultimately, you know, like I and I think about this too is like you know if the power's out, how do you make coffee? Oh, like, I got that one. I got that one. Guess we, what? We got, we got, we got we, firewood. So we use the firewood. <laughs> oh, here's the other thing. We also have what? 12 things of propane that we have here. And I always have emergency. <laughs> well, and you know, cause I was in the coffee world. Like I know how to do a pour over, which, you know, seems fancy, but it's really like old school, you know, like you got your gas, you know, you put your kettle on and you just pour, you know, yeah. have your French press, you know? So when you're thinking about like that resiliency, you're also thinking about what, what makes me feel happy and you know coffee makes me feel happy um especially that 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 first light of after a hurricane and all the power is out and you're not sure if it's going to be a few days or a few weeks um to just be able to like sit on the porch and like drink a nice hot cup of coffee is like everything and and trust me (laughs) and for me it's a snickers bar and some skittles i want to taste the rainbow (laughs) Trust me, I want to taste the rainbow. Like, I mean, you got to have the thing that you need, something that you want. What sparks joy. What sparks your joy, right? And so Skittles sparks my joy, you know? It's a sugar rush for sure. For me, it's Reese's Pieces. Right, and for you, it's Reese's Pieces. So it's like finding those things. And and, and guess what? When you throw that little thing inside your bag and something's going on and you go, (gasps) <gasps> it doesn't matter what just happened, right? You're you're eating well, your Snickers well, bar. And, and and full body wipes. Yes. Full body wipes are a thing. They're at Target. They're not that expensive. You're good to go. Trust me on that. Trust me. And so <laughs> a lot of this stuff that we're talking about about resilience, I really like how Javon couched it towards just a second ago, where she says, You have to figure out what you, not what your next door neighbor not what's happening around the corner. You got to start here. And I think that what you said about the resiliency is built within us Mm -hmm. is very important for all of us on this call to not just understand, but share with people that aren't here. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that I will tell everyone is that our network is much greater than what we think if we just make sure we try to stay connected. So I'm looking on here right now. There's about 46 people on here, right? Now, I don't know if these 46 people know each other, right? Or have ever met each other. But connecting yourselves with like-minded people, regardless of where they are, also helps you create a network. Mm -hmm. Because it's really interesting when someone tells me, oh, I'm looking for this. But, you know, I know you ain't in Colorado, so you probably don't know anybody. And I'm like, oh, no, I know a couple of people in Colorado. And they're like, wait, what? You know people in Colorado? How do you know people in Colorado? I was like, did you say you needed something or what? So I think that we we have to be connected, right? We have to have these conversations with folks that we, did. I don't know you. I have no idea who Carla Rosen is or who Kathy's iPhone is or who Candy Thomas is. That's an interesting name, Candy. See, we're talking about Candy. But I'm just saying, you know, like we we have to be able to connect with each other on on mm-hmm. for lack of better words, a cellular level as in cell phones. Well, um and and I also think within that, so yes, we're, you know, we do have our own personal go bags and herbal emergency kits and emergency kits and backup kit, you know, like whatever. We we're country folks here. Um but what's but, your fallback? That's what you but but say. no, I think the other thing of it, it is, especially um for me as a as an herbalist, is like especially at the beginning of, of COVID, was like that so many people are trying to find support. And so 
you know, and I was also trying to make sure that I support my family. So my, my, my parents and my little brother are still in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, my sisters live in Atlanta. I'm here on the coast about five, four, five hours away from them. And so I wanted to make sure that my people were okay. So I, the reason I started making hand sanitizer was because my parents couldn't get it. And my mom had just had um, breast surgery yeah. for breast cancer mm -hmm. and was actually, while we were all going into to shelter in place, she was going to do um, radiation therapy every day. Yeah. Um, and so, and my dad's a truck driver <laughs> for FedEx. Right. Right. So he, he was definitely essential, um, mm -hmm. staff. And so I wanted to make sure that my people were, were protected. And so I just started making stuff to one, make sure that we were taken care of, make sure that we could send stuff to, to Matthew's kids in Atlanta to make sure that I could send stuff to my mom and dad and my sisters mm -hmm. and, and so, and, and also make sure that we had enough for people out here. So when we're, when we're talking about like, we're prep, like prepping, like, it's not like for us, it's not like there's a bag and it's just for us. It's like, no, I made sure that, you know, I got enough beans and rice and, you know, um, flour and sugar and, and different, you know, like nut milks, nut, mil nut milks instead of like, you know, I don't yeah. do a lot of dairy, but you know, nut milks, because I knew if somebody needed something, I could have it. And so I bought in bulk specifically because we have, you know, Matthew's, you know, dad and, you know, um, his wife over here, we've got cousins over here. You know, we had folks shelter in place with us um, because they, they needed to get out of the, the city and they wanted to have a nice safe space with outdoor space to, to join us. And so we had people joining us. And so we were like, you know, yes, bring stuff with you, but know that we will also have stuff for you. Mm -hmm. And if somebody over there is like, we ran out of this, we knew that as leaders on this hill, as leaders in this community, that we wanted to make sure that we had enough to where we could also share that um, and make sure that our people were, were taken care of. And then for us, and for me, especially as an herbalist, you know, I made sure that my families got their packages before I put anything for sale on my website. So, you know, I kind Eating of take, take that thing yeah. that Dr. Lenny Sorensen like instilled in me was that make sure that you're taking care of yourself and your people mm -hmm. before you put things on market. And so, yes, you know, I could have made you know, way more money by selling everything. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that my people were also covered and protected as well. So, so bringing that into my world was so important during that time. So, yeah. So we have time for like one more question. Um, does anyone have something that's just burning? Whether, and it could come from you, Carrie, or Sarah, or anybody, any, anything we didn't cover that you wanted us to cover? The only, Matthew, the only thing, of course, it, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, as you know, is and you brought up the thing about cooking and so many people are afraid of cooking. And it's it's uh, it's something that we need to get over the fear of. It's okay to not have your food look like it came out of yeah. the French Laundry menu. Right. Yeah. I. 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 <laughs> oh my goodness. So here now, you want to talk about some interesting conversation we've had since COVID. You'd be surprised how many conversations we had we've had with people like, I I, I never made like tuna salad, and I was like never made tuna salad before? N nah, but they had a lot of tuna in the store, so I went ahead and bought some. I, I was I was blown away. <laughs> um the 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 thought process of um also though is where people are trying to learn. And I think that um one of the things that Javon and I have looked into and I think we'll probably start doing at some point um because it was a conversation on there and it was like does Javon teach herbalism classes? Um, and <laughs> I, I've I had will, people I will ask be in about, the new year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people have asked about me doing the really short cooking classes because here's the deal. There are a lot of people that get married, they get all these amazing pots and pans and knives and neither one of them have ever cooked before. They never know it because, you know, when you're in love and you're just going out eating all the time, it sounds great and it seems like a great life. But now neither one of you can cook. So now you're back to the eat out mode thing, but you got these really nice knives, pots and pans. And then you feel that, well, I make enough money, but what happens when the money runs out? Like being able to cook 
is part of life skills. Um, and for, for me, whenever I talk to young people, um, I always explain and have this conversation about if you are by yourself, how do you sustain yourself? And when I get them to looking at me like, well, there's ramen. And I was like, yeah, but ramen after about day seven. Get you a cast iron you know, skillet and an Instapot. And an Instapot. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about that life. Because I'm going to tell you, cast iron, once it's seasoned well, you can cook anything in it, right? An Instapot, if you have some electricity, you can put a frozen chicken in that, have it ready in less than 30 minutes. So trust me when I say there are things there for you to learn how to cook. Javon and I actually had this whole conversation about, you know, we should do a COVID-19 Instapot commercial that's just <laughs> based on, by the way, just so everybody knows, we have six Instapots. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a problem. It's a problem. Um, but it's part of it, six. so part of how it happened is like, so for the first, the first hurricane, um, our ceiling fell in in our in our schoolhouse. So we didn't used to live here. We used to live in the historic schoolhouse that's on the property. Right. So we were displaced for six months, and the place that someone had for us didn't have a full kitchen. Right. And so our restaurant was already built on induction. So we brought an induction burner to mm -hmm. the house. And then I was just like, okay, I keep hearing about this instant pot. Like, let's let, try it out. Let yeah. me just try it out. I found a special, you know, got it, whatever, and fell in love. Like, if all you have is like one induction burner and an instant, an instant pot, pot, you can live and good. a sink and a fridge, you're good. You don't even need a sink. You just need well, water. You can figure it you out. Get a hose outside. But, but that was literally, so for us, like having the, you know, people who are cooks, chefs, mm -hmm. foodies, I'm a wellness coach. I help people meal prep and all that kind of good stuff um, is like, in that space of just being like, we need to eat food and we can't eat out all the time. Right. Like, so that has featured prominently. And then, you know, the, the, it's kind of like um, rabbits or cats. They just keep breeding and all of a sudden we have six of them. So, yeah. And, so and then people, how that works. Right. And then people were doing this. They were like, I heard you. I saw that thing you did on uh, on Facebook uh, with that Instapot. I got one and I don't know how to use it. Do you want it? Sure. Sure. Why not? I'll take a free Instapot any day. And the next thing you know, I was like, I want to fry Instapot to get the Instapot top. I mean, the, the, it's like it's it's a rabbit it's hole. A, it's a rabbit hole that we can go down. But I'm saying, it gives if you, you want to learn how to cook, there are lots of ways to learn. There are lots of things out there. Someone said, "Hey, that's all I cook in is cast iron." True story. Yeah. Like, get yourself one good piece of cast iron or, and an Instapot. Or 20. Or pieces. 20. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we have we, lots we, of cast iron. Yes, yes. I have a cast iron collection. collection. That's so, like so, you know, so stuff, yes, yeah. I love my Instapots and I also have a cast iron collection. Yeah. So, so for me, That's it's, like, happy place. it's balance, you know, right? Like, you know, we can, we can do both ends here. Yeah, yeah. Now, Matthew, there's a, there's a question about your book and you need to, to you can oh, plug that um, yeah. yes. So my, huh, wow. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for that reminder. <laughs> uh, so my cookbook, uh, is out. It is on, uh, Amazon right now. It's, uh, Javon's going to type it in real quick. Yeah. It's called Bressam Nyam, which means, uh, blessing and eat my friends in, uh, Gullah Geechee. Um, and what it's based on is like my life, uh, here at the farm. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, how would I say it? Um, it's an ode to my my uh, family, and it's an ode to a life here um, on the farm. It's an ode to uh, to food systems and food ways, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like encapsulating uh, the twenty five plus years I have um, in the industry, um, and encapsulating it in you know things like fried mullet. Mm -hmm. um, five mullet row, which here's a very interesting fact. Gray mullet in, uh, in Italy uh, and uh, Greece is called Bretaga. And um, it's very expensive. But when I told people that I was in Italy and ate Bretaga, they were like, what is that? And I said, it's mullet row. <clears throat> As a kid, I grew up eating mullet, mullet row. I never knew that it was a delicacy. Um, but oftentimes you got to go to other places. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, 
it's an amazing book. Um, I think uh, I think there's something in it for everyone. Um, lots of uh, funny anecdotes in there also um, about things like me making something called Magic Cobbler and the like. So, yeah. Um, what was that? That's available on Kindle. Yes, too. and it's also available on Kindle also. So um, all the pre-sales have already started um, and uh, it will officially be out uh may 2021 yep. and um any book that is done on pre-sales i will also already have autographs so um go ahead and get that book it's gonna be great um yeah breast and yam thank you so much um i'm excited to get that book um i'm gonna wrap us up just so that folks can have a short break before our plenary this afternoon which starts at noon mountain time. Uh, this is uh, gonna be a really interesting conversation with um, folks talking about activating rural places. Um, this is a plenary that's organized by our New Grant Apprenticeship Program. So just a, a nod to that. Um, so before we sign off, Javon and Matthew, thank you so, so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, what a wonderful well, conversation, well. a lot of, uh, really inspiring things that you touched on. And um, uh, I hope that you will join us again in the future, that um, your network has been expanded by uh, being here today. Um, really wonderful to learn about your work. Um, I have some other announcements. Carrie, are there any other thoughts, things that you want to say before we depart? No, the, the only thing is, is that we get so bogged down sometimes in the in the why and the what and the and the detail and the technical part and to see the joy that these two folks have brought and they 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 get mired in, in the muck as we all do but I want to thank you all for ending <laughs> this keynote on a really um, spiritually happy happy note thank you and for those of you who don't know anything about the Gula Gichis it's you need to learn about it. It's a really neat part of our heritage. So thank you very much for bringing that forward, Matthew. And Javon, again, I love you dearly. Definitely, definitely. You all have a great and amazing day, yes, everyone. Thank you um, for your time. And we had a fabulous time and thank you for your time, definitely. Thank you all again for being here. As a reminder, books, check out Matthew's book, check out our bookstore. We have lots of really great um, text being offered by our local bookshop bookworks they've curated a list so if you haven't checked that out yet please do we're going to encourage them to carry your book Matthew um, we have a plenary starting at noon um, we also have career connection this evening which is a, a agricultural con a conversation about uh, engaging in an agricultural career. It's usually a job fair. It's a little different this year. You can still register if you would like to. Um, 